And once again, I'd like to welcome everybody back to the Buffalo History Channel as we are in the midst of our spring season. And this is a very special spring season because we are going to be, we are deep diving into the history of Buffalo's Black media with two different, two of the two part series. One series is the Soul of Buffalo TV, the series version. We did the original production version at the top of 2022. Now we've, we followed that up with a series, which has plenty of interviews and clips of old TV shows. And the, the other part is uh, Legends of Buffalo Radio, some of Buffalo's greatest to hit the mic. So um, hopefully, hopefully you've been enjoying that. We started this in April. And uh, speaking of the soul of Buffalo TV, <laughs> I mean... Y'all see who I got with me. I mean, what is there to say? This about is this? too much. Doug. What is there to say about this woman right here? What is there to say? Peace I and mean... love. <laughs> Baba Simba would say to say peace and love, right? <laughs> That's all I could say right now. I'm just honored to be a part of what you're doing because it's so essential for our community. Um, when I heard you were leaving Buffalo, it was so sad and but I, I said to you, Doug, please don't stop. Remember us. And you have mm -hmm. not stopped. You have been yeah. digging, researching, gathering yeah. information, putting our history in the proper context and writing our own narrative is so important. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, y'all know who she is. You know, <laughs> you today, many of you will see her all over the community. Every wow. event, she's all that. She's at all the events. She's always supporting. She's working behind the scenes on different things. But those of us who are more seasoned, I'll say, like yourself, we, we remember <laughs> her as the newswoman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Came into our homes many, many evenings back in the day. Right. And I hear Later. people tell me about this from time to well, time just, and how me, they watch. I never knew. Ladies and gentlemen, I haven't even given her the formal introduction. Let me introduce and welcome Sandy White to the Buffalo History Channel. Welcome, Sandy. Sandy White from the Fruit Felt, Sandy White from North Buffalo, <laughs> Sandy White from Buffalo. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I guess it just made perfect sense. We've been, for the past several weeks and months, we've been watching you on the a lot of these old clips of uh, Afro Central and City Scene. So yes. why it makes perfect sense to have you on here for this. And but, I thank you very much, Doug, because we are so proud of you. Yes. So why don't we, what better place to start than from the beginning? How did it all, <laughs> how did it all begin for you, Sandy, in media? We're going into ancient history, right? <laughs> oh, not that. Well, Doug, <laughs> in essence, I was just a little regular black child on the east side with pigtails and glasses, but I also had big dreams and I wanted to see the world and I wanted to see and understand other people. And one day I looked in a magazine, Doug, and I, I don't know if I told you this story, and I saw a projector and a form that I could fill out with a number two pencil. And I filled out that form, got an envelope, got a stamp from my mother, I sent it out. And the next thing you know, my father walks in with a projector with slides of people from around the world. So my, I was a visual learner. And so I've just lived in a room with images all over the walls. And that, that was my first entry into understanding the world through visuals. Oh, my father was an amazing man. Let me tell you, uh, he used to say to me that, you know, you remind me of me. I said, what do you mean by that? He says, you love people. You care about people. You want to help people. He says, you know, that's that's something that I've been about. And he says, I can see that in, in you. And I, I feel good about that. And that's what I've always tried to do. He was a real estate broker for 30 plus years, maybe longer here. One of the few Black African American, the few Black real estate brokers in Western New York, people coming, migrating from the South, coming up here to Buffalo, wanting to buy a property, Mr. White would hook them up. 
And it's during a period when there was just a lot of uh, difficulties for African Americans getting in certain neighborhoods. Yes, oh, well, let me please. tell you about the Challenger real quick. It's very important, you know, factually for me to just say this. My father was friends with so many people and he worked with Mr. Eve. He worked with businesses in the community. So when Mr. Eve contacted him about starting a, a community newspaper, he said, you, my dad said to him, you can move into the back of our real estate office to get it started. I never knew about this. Okay. But Mr. Eve confirmed that to me many years ago. And my mother to this day confirms it to me. He says, oh yeah, Mr. Eve, we had it in the back, but eventually he bought the property across the street. And this is when it was on Fillmore. And so the fact that I wound up in news and community is kind of interesting, but when you're involved with community, you cross many paths. So maybe that's not surprising. Your original life's plan was to go into psychology. I really? wanted to go into psychology, Doug, because I wanted to understand what was happening in our community with our families. Um, I, I wanted to clearly have an understanding of why people make the decisions that they do that affect the lives of others. And uh, that's just my natural nature. I didn't go into psychology. I started out that way. But um, fate had it that I would go into broadcasting. And I decided to do that because I realized that I could help people by giving them information that they could make good decisions for their families. And that when a person of color is walking in the door with a camera, it may, you can make a more of an impact in what people see in terms of the narrative. So that's why I chose it. And also doors were open. There were individuals that uh, whose their names are well known, Bill Gator, yes. okay, Coles, Mr. Smith. I'm sure your father was also engaged yes. in that, yes, knocking sir. on the doors mm -hmm. to make sure that people of color had a chance to break it into the business. Yeah. You know, when we're trying to get in the door, sometimes we don't know all those names, but I thank right. them for all of what they have done to make it possible for me to get my foot in the door. A few of those names, a few more of those names would be, uh, I'm sure you know, John Smith from the Buffalo Black John Union Coalition. Smith, absolutely. In fact, John Smith was very active once I got a, uh, was able to secure a job at Channel 4 in monitoring how they hired File reviews. And I remember, mm -hmm, I remember him wanting to look through the the logs and and to report to the FCC from time to time. I don't know if they do that as much now, but I do know that he was on it and he would be in touch with all of us and wanted to know what was happening in that station and then would meet with the general manager about issues that we would tell him about. Interestingly enough, I I used to go with him for those file reviews when I was a teenager. Yeah, he used to take he used to take me with him. So that was oh before my. I got before I started breaking into the business. So I So you got an understanding early yeah. on on how the system works. Oh yeah. I, and I started out and was then I can remember I remember when I first got back from college uh to start in the workforce. Uh, he he would he was still doing them. This is back in nine, early 1994 and he took me with him cuz he knew I was fresh out of college and I was literally in the offices of all three general managers of all of two, four, and seven. So I, I definitely remember those days. You know, he had a quiet, unassuming way, but he was laser sharp in terms of his thinking and his goals. You knew he was there to find out exactly what's going on. And those general managers knew too, right? And yes. And another, another name I was going to mention, I know you mentioned his last name, uh, Bob Coles one of the first in black employees at channel seven. And he was a, a union legend rep, major union yes. representative at WKBW. And I, I, I was so glad I was able to tell him when I returned from California, how much I appreciated his support because listen, Doug, here mm. I am, I'm going to Canisius college, right? Mm. I'm wearing overalls. I work on the, on the weekends <clears throat> and I'm, Attending school, but I'm writing down the commercial times for the log. Back right. then, that's what we were doing. So what a great job. You get, you have an opportunity to just watch television and study and write down the log. That's the control and traffic. Yep. 
That's I right. I did it too. Did you really? Yes, oh I my did. Goodness. Starting out. W and E D. Yep. That's amazing. Well, that's how we got us in, I think. Don't you think, Jug? Yep. That's how they gave it, they opened that little door. And so I was able to meet, see Irv Rick and Tom, go and watch all the broadcasts, go into the newsroom, talk to folks. But I just always had this special time with Bob Coles. He would come into the announce booth and he would sit down and he would ask me, so how are you doing? I say, I'm fine. Just, so what are you doing to get ready? Get ready for the opportunities that are going to come. And he even bought a book for me, How to Dress for Success, because I was, you know, I was dressing in jeans. I was a college student. He says, but dress for the job you want. And he would listen to me and he would give me advice. He would mentor me. He would encourage me. He never scolded, but he was always inspirational. And I think that I probably would not have gone into the business if it had not been for him, because he was like that father figure in the business that really gave me good guidance. So Love you, Bob Coles. Absolutely. We all do. Uh, Canisius College. Um, what was your experience like at Canisius? I know you were part of the, not only were you a communications major, but you were part of the uh, Black Student Union. Right. And it, it was so exciting to to be able to go to school at Canisius and not be in the snow, but to go underground and uh, through the tunnels. And uh, we had an Afro club. I didn't know at the time that that Afro club uh, was created and was a part of a larger effort made by Leroy Johnson, Tarabu Kirkland, and uh, some other brothers and sisters that kind of took a stand for better programming at Kenesha. So here I am back in the day, I'm active with Black Student Union, so to speak, or the Afro Club. And we didn't really clearly understand at that time that these brothers had taken time to sit in, sit outside Dembski's office and demand changes for African-Americans. That's why it's so important to know your history. So I, I actually wouldn't uh, apologize to Leroy because I said, I didn't know that you did that for us. Thank you for doing that. And I'm glad I was able to tell him face to face, Leroy, I didn't know. Thank you. So we were active. I've got to tell you, we were very active and aware. And we needed that at Canisius uh, because we felt sometimes very isolated. Uh, even though you're in the Black community and, and the Canisius campus, we felt slightly isolated. So the clubs were very important for us. Okay, now afterwards, uh, you became seen here. You were a news intern at WEBR News Radio nine seventy. Uh, what was those? What were those memories like? In the early days of my career, I, I didn't have a clear understanding of where I was going to go, how it would materialize and take place. But I did have my first experience in the newsroom of a radio station, WEBR News Radio nine seventy. And I would be tearing copy. You know, I don't even know if they do that anymore. But um, I would work with traffic. I would work with the newsroom, the public affairs department. I was basically an intern. But that's how you learn the business. You don't just get the job. You have to work through the steps in securing a new position. And so I realized I had to work hard. That's the one thing that I never, ever expected, something for nothing. I was taught by my parents and, you know, all the mentors in my life, you've got to work hard twice. What is it? The old saying, you got to work twice as hard twice as to hard. be accepted as equal. Yes. But I, I, I do believe that it's good to work hard because, it, you know, you, you get your rhythm and your grind and you know exactly the level you want. When you want to level up, you can level up. I remember being told that myself many, many times. Uh, now, this part right here, I'm not sure which came first. Um, mm -hmm. um, was it some, you were, we were part of Sunship Communications. But right. uh, did and, that come before Afro Central or? Well, I, I'll have you start at Sunship I think so. I think so. So, as you know, um, in the community, there, there was an interest on my part in going into 
television or understanding what it was. Right. I didn't really clearly know. I was going into psychology. So, right. you know, just meeting these brothers that were about community, you know, Clarence Smith, mm -hmm. Tafawa Hicks, yes. Ron Wooford. Kamal all Fields. These, yeah, Kam brother Kamal Fields, who's still uh, on the case. Oh, yes. <laughs> I just love him. So these they impressed me. Okay, now this is a time when we are really wanting some changes in our community. And um, I just thought, you know, using the camera, we can make the change that we want to see. And I think this song, The Revolution Will Not Be tele Televised by Gil Scott, kind of tweaked my mind into thinking maybe this is how we're going to do this. You know, and uh, we went out uh, for Juneteenth festivals on Jefferson at the time uh, with big bulky cameras. And yeah. big packs with yeah, yeah, you, huge you, tapes. Yeah, you did a uh, you you did a uh, shoot. You and you did a shoot with Sunship at the June Juneteenth nineteen seventy eight festival. Any many memories from that? I do. I have many memories. We were they were all wearing afros. They were all wearing. You know, there's some people that have became political leaders. Uh, we interviewed, and this was before they even took that move. Like you know, the council president Pitts. Uh, I interviewed him way before he really got into the political arena and others. It was a beautiful experience. Um, it's the same kind of experience we we really feel even today with Juneteenth, when you're around your people, when you hear the music, the drums, and you can just get a sense that uh, it's safe and all is well. Uh, the celebration of culture is very important for people of color because we have lost that understanding of who we are. So Juneteenth festivals always were very helpful in bringing us back to ourselves. As we saw, and I'm, before I go into that, I mean, we, I think a lot of times, you know, I've, I've realized, you know, from doing this work that we talk about Sunship Communications, uh, it should never go on notice that, you know, most people hear Sunship Communications today and in recent years. They, they have no idea they, what Sunship they, is about. Right. They immediately think of the group that ran public access. But they right. what they don't know is that the, the Sunship Communication of the 70s, when they started, they were they were educating the community about media and media production and the mm -hmm. Oscar Michaud Theater and the introduction I mean, of cable TV to the community. They were way ahead of everyone else. And and yes. and, and I credit Clarence and <laughs> The leadership of Sonship with understanding the the big picture, right? right? Mm -hmm. So with with the Oscar Michaud Theater, which was previously the Kensington Theater, uh, learning about Oscar Michaud, the great filmmaker, who's actually uh, someone that I still to this day cannot understand how he was able to do what he was able to do in terms of not just shooting the films but distributing them and putting those films in the back of his truck or a back of his, in the trunk of his car and taking them to the theaters across the country. Clarence Smith to me is, is quiet, but powerful. And he was able to bring community folk together to do some very, very important things. And what he did is he helped me understand who I was in this, in this world, in terms of community. And I think that that's so important when we have elders, and I'm speaking to him as an elder, but we were all around the same age. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, mean, I, I, I can't say enough about Clarence Smith and the role he's played in terms of shaping my life. He won't tell you, but he was always there to say, well, Sandy, uh, we have uh, an opportunity for you to go to South Africa with with us, would you like to go to South Africa? I said, yes. Sandy, we have an opportunity to go to Festec to, to in Nigeria for the big, I mean, he was always giving me information that I would never ever get on my own about the larger world, about the world of black and brown people outside of Buffalo. Right. And right. and so Clarence and, and, and the group of Sonship Communications, I credit for that. Okay, Afro Central and City Scene. For the past several months, we have you have shown up in a lot of those videos. 
talk to us about how you got involved with that. You know, you told me one day um, on Facebook that you're finding a lot of video of me. And I had no idea what you were talking about. You said, Sandy, you're everywhere. And I'm like, what is he talking about? <laughs> then I'm watching the History Channel and I'm looking at your clips and I'm seeing I have done quite a bit of work here in my community. City Scene was big for me. Afro Central, I mean, all of those programs were very central. That was our voice. That was our narrative. The, the whole key is there's more happening in our community than what you're telling us. And that's what those programs were designed to do. That's why you had people like Lorna Hill, creative minds like Lorna Hill and Ron Wifford engaged in those programs. We wanted to change the narrative. And I, I felt honored to be out front introducing those segments. They did all the hard work. I basically was the face so that they can get the word out. But uh, I didn't realize how important that was until I left Buffalo and returned. Mm -hmm. And now you have discovered, and we are very thankful to the Ron Wilford estate, I believe. It's very, and very. His daughter, Courtney, uh, his wife, uh, Dr. Bruce Cosby. Absolutely, we are. We thank them. Oh, thank Because you. my thank family, you. the Gales family. Yes. You know what? That Let's talk about some of the, the pieces that we've seen. Let's start with the iconic Gales family. The Gales what was family. That? Yeah, take us back to that piece that you did on the on the. That when I looked at that piece, I started singing, and I remember all the edits, and I remember putting that piece together. I hadn't thought about it for years, but I thought, you know, that's these people have. I've always remembered them, even though I was in Los Angeles. I even still have the albums in my storage. I have like six of the Gales family albums. And I, I ran into one of them the other day and I said, I still have your album. I felt like a fan. <laughs> Let's do a story because the mother. Yes. So loving. I remember her specifically. I felt the love and anointing from her. And it just made me even more uh, determined to do a, a very good story on this family. But they made it easy. The Gales family, they still are singing. They may not be singing in front of you, but they are their amazing group of uh, talents in our community. And I love each one of them. And actually, here's another thing you didn't know. One of the Gales family members was my music teacher. Really? Edna Gales. Yes, Edna. Okay. back in the day. Okay. Oh, yeah, back in the day. And every time I see her, I says, I know you. You're my music teacher. And I started singing Hark Are the Bells, Sweet Silver Bells to her. And she's like, oh, my God. But, you know, <laughs> it's just it's just beautiful. Uh, that that family, I will always remember them. And I, if they would like a few of those albums, I'll return them. Three words. But they give them to me. <laughs> Three words, Mary Crosby Chappelle. Take us back to that piece. <laughs> what a woman. What a woman, what a queen. Absolutely. Uh, I looked at the piece the other day after decades and uh, <clears throat> she taught me something then and she's still teaching today how to be powerful in your role, how to be a strong Black woman, how to use who you are to get the job done. I mean, she's a no-nonsense uh, type of person. And I enjoyed, I was so blessed as a young reporter to meet th these elders and the queens that passed on that, that knowledge that I needed to have. Rick James. We had a had a piece with you. You were in his house. You did a nice profile. He was doing his his homecoming concert, which I was shocked to see. Take us back to that to that piece. What was it like to interview Rick? I got a call. I was working at Channel Four. Received a call from the 
from his assistant, I believe it was, to the newsroom, and the words start bubbling around the newsroom. Rick James wants you to come in for an exclusive interview all day, as long as you want, on him, his life, and preparation for the big concert. I was okay with that. You know, I'm a reporter. I'm trained as you are, mm -hmm. Doug. We're journalists. I mean, surely we're a little yeah. excited about it. But, um, you know, we get our blinders on and we go directly in, right? right. To get the story and uh, to be also aware of who we're talking to. Uh, and he gave us all his time. He was on the horse. He was, I saw all the swimming pool or the one swimming pool. He had like eight or nine different rooms, the Emerald room, the fur room. There were just so many rooms. I had never been to a home like this. I felt um, so, I was very intrigued by Rick James because I, I was trying to get back to who he really was. And he did. Explain to me, you know, James Johnson is one guy and Rick James is a persona that he's created. And uh, we talked about that and we talked about whether or not he's happy about that. Now, that's that psychology background of mine, just stepping in early, even my interview with him. But I wanted to understand him. And um, he was just gracious. He's extremely gracious. I got to meet um Leroy Johnson and his brother an attorney who's very quietly in the background um his mother over a period of time Betty Gladden who became a good friend of mine um his sisters and over a period of time over the years um you know all of them you know you've got head you have so mm. many members of that family and um uh, I just had a very good relationship and still do. Okay. So as we transition to your WIVB TV, you are a, you became a general assignment reporter at WIVB TV channel four. Um, take us back to it. I mean, what was, what was it like? And, and, I'll, and I'll say this because I've, I've mentioned this before in previous interviews. Um, any. <clears throat> At that particular time, you know, any any time in most black households, and certainly in even in my household, in my grandparents' household, mm -hmm. we would have the TV on, and no matter what we would do, any time a black face came on the air, everything stopped, and we were in front of the TV. So, isn't that something? How that were, happens? You you were among you were among those reporters. You yourself and John Winston and Sheila Allen and Chuck Lampkin, mm -hmm. Les Trent, all. Stan Coleman, all the OGs back in the day. Anytime y'all came on the on the on the screen, everything stopped and we were we were right there in front of the TV just to see what y'all were gonna report on. So talk to us about what, what it was like being at WIVB TV. Sure. Uh, I think probably people stopped and I would do that too, because it's a measurement of progress. How much progress are we making? We're on the air, okay. Like even today, there are not enough African Americans or Black and Brown people in right. in Western New York that satisfies uh, me personally. Right. Um, behind the scenes, or me. Um, <laughs> uh, making management decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have some journalists that are doing fantastic jobs, and we're very excited about that. But we can do better in Western New York. Uh, and so, um, you know, I was jumping back in time, I think that that was a period when you didn't see many of us at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've seen the yeah the pictures bear that out. I mean, even even when I started my career, I'm I'm when I was at Empire, I was the only one in the building. So I I in '96, so I can re I can relate to that. And it and it was very difficult because you. You knew that you were um, a pioneer of sorts. You hate to even use that word, but you knew that we had to do it. We had to do it right. We have to be strong with our work. Uh, right. And But we also knew we were going to be subject to some kind of uh, second guessing. You know, what? one thing that I always remember um, that bothered me a little bit, and it told me a lot about the power of media gatekeepers and those behind the scenes, uh, yeah. This was before Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday was initiated. 
passed and became law. And I wanted to do a story on that, you know, the initiative, the effort, the advocacy. And I, an assignment editor said, eh, we don't need to do a story on that. When it's a holiday or when there's a sale, that's when we know it's a holiday. Right. And I, I, I just basically had to take a deep breath and just chill for a minute because that burned that burned deep in my soul. But I said, this is the kind of animal, this is the kind of spirit that we're dealing with in this business. So we just got to keep on keeping on as the elders have said, but I would correct someone if I felt they were out of line. This person was saying it in jest, but they determined, this person determined whether or not there was a news story. Yeah. That power, the gatekeepers. Yeah, gatekeepers. I know a lot about them. I mean, you walk. It's a fine line that you walk in, in these in these types of environments. I I dealt. Lord knows, I dealt with it many times throughout the '90s when I was in the TV. In TV, and I'm I wasn't trying to actually be on air at the time when I got into TV. I I actually wanted to be in the commercial production department, so I had a completely different direction that I was, you know, trying to go into. But I. Oh, how did you jump from um, radio to television? Because I, I was very proud of you when you did that. Uh, well, radio, quite frankly, I, I never really intended to be on the radio. Uh, that that really happened by accident. I mm -hmm. I was doing some work at the, for the Adam. I was at the Adams Market and met Catherine Roberts, and I had some shows on public access that she had saw, and and she just happened to ask me if I was interested in being in radio and. I'm sure when she introduced me to Skip Dillard, this is back in late 19, right. towards the end of 1999. And then another big I, name I got on, I wound up getting on WBLK. That's, that was how I got on there. That's. I know. Wow. Yeah. You know, you have <laughs> that's good a little pipes, segue there. Say. Yeah. Yeah. But the, you have good pipes. You have good voice. Oh yeah. So when you have that kind of a voice, um, I just figured that you would find your way to radio at one point. Yeah. And, and you did. I can remember my last semester at college before I graduated, and uh, this was fall of '93. Because I had to take some mm -hmm. extra, had, I need some extra credit hours, so I took this radio announcing course, and I came out of there with like an A plus. Of like, course, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> that's uh, that that, but I I was never really interested in radio. I was always Isn't it interesting in, how you I find was, your way, yeah, you find was, your path. You didn't even plan that, did you? Yeah, I was always into television. Television was television behind the scenes and doing commercials. That's actually what I wanted to do. And I wound up doing all this. Stuff. So that's the way life works. So it's all preparation for something. Yeah. And I, I think that uh, the TV business was, you know, not my plan, but it seemed to be part of the path for me. And storytelling is what I enjoy. Changing the narrative is what I believe is essential for right. people of color and so um any stories that, you, that mm -hmm. any stories that stick out to you that you did from back in the day that you remember well you know doug i've met and interviewed so many people yeah. um yeah. um from eddie murphy richard pryor miles davis but i think the one that um really has made an impression on me was uh coretta scott king in Atlanta mm -hmm. and just meeting and being in her presence was so very powerful for me. And um, there are others. Yeah. There's just, you know, the hardworking woman who's got four or five kids and she's trying to make a living and she's also giving back to her community. Right. Those are important stories. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they make it, sometimes they don't. Right but they're the untold story. So I always like to share that because in our community, we have value yeah. and we feel just because we're not, we don't have a degree, we're just because you may not make a lot of money that we don't have value. But yeah. I believe our value is so strong in our community and it's so intense. And if we just look within and see it, we, we would be able to do even more. Yep. Okay, so you made it to the, you eventually went from general assignment reporter at WIBB <clears throat> to, uh, you became a co-anchor on, on Channel 4. That was fun. <laughs> okay. That was fun. I hadn't planned on that. It seems that this interview is telling you one thing. 
Some things I planned, but most of it I didn't plan. Yeah. It just like a door open, a path became available. And a lot of it is due to the advocacy of those that came before me. And so when those doors opened for me if to become an anchor, um, I said, yes, you don't turn your back on an opportunity. And I worked hard and I became the weekend co-anchor with uh, Rich Newberg at WIBB TV. Wasn't in that position very long because Hollywood called. Yes. And I wanted to go to that next. Uh, you went you went to Los Angeles, California. At a, you worked at a few stations and then which eventually would take you to BET, where you launched a part of their West West Coast. West Coast. Talk to us about the stations you worked for and BET. Once I, I got the word that uh, WIBB here in Buffalo wanted me to be the co-anchor with Rich Newberg, who was a wonderful man and a great journalist. Mm -hmm. um, I said, this is a dream come true. And and it started, you know, we started doing our programs. and But I didn't know that the TV stations in town, the general managers had sent my stories and my tapes around to other stations to get me out of town. And that's what they did back in the day. And my tapes wound up uh, in Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles. And they saw my work and they made a call. And from there led... Uh, two trips to LA to see palm trees and and meet their team. Eventually, they made an offer to my agent. I had an agent at that point, and the agent said, "This is a deal you don't want to turn your back on." I said, "But hey, I'm the weekend co-anchor. I can't leave this amazing job." But my agent said, "Hollywood is calling. You must respond." And so I left Buffalo and eventually returned. But while I was on the West Coast, I did work at a Fox station as well. And eventually did some work for Black Entertainment Television because I became um, friendly with Bob Johnson, who was in Washington. And I pitched him the idea of having a West Coast office. He said, that's a nice idea because at the time, Donnie Simpson and all these other folks were doing Washington oriented Hollywood stories. Right. I said, I'm here on the West Coast. I can do those interviews, those Hollywood entertainment stories. And the reason why I branched off into entertainment is I had gotten very tired of, of the grind of general assignment uh, in Los Angeles. There was just so much uh, murder and mayhem. Uh, there was uh, blood and guts, as they called uh, it. There was a lot. When you're a general assignment reporter, you cover it all. But there was also um, great stories. You know, you cover award shows. You wear gowns. Um, you cover the fact that it's 80 degrees and you're at Santa Monica and you're doing a live shot about the weather being 80 degrees. I mean, I, I just, I had the full range of stories and I also co-anchored on the weekend there and had great opportunities. And so my time at KNBC was very rich, but I hopped around. Okay. So um, you returned, you would eventually return to Buffalo. I remember, and you landed at Channel 2, WGRZ TV, and you wound up uh, co-anchoring with Les Trent. Right. Working in Los Angeles was a joy. And I, I mean, I I will never, ever say that that was not the right move because I learned a lot about myself. I learned about uh, people and I love uh, avocados and sushi and uh, the <laughs> beach and uh, working with Mr. Johnson to, you know, create a West Coast branch with his team there. However, there's no place like home. Right. And after a while, um, I wanted to return back to Western New York over a period of time. I and mean, we're talking not just one year, over a five year period, I decided to return to Western New York and opportunities became available to me uh, at that time. And so I came in. Okay, and what was it like to be, you co-anchored with Les Trent? Um, what was, what were your memories of that? Les Trent 
was a dynamo. He was a talent. He he had so much energy and so much joy. And I loved working with Les Trent. Um, and I'm so proud of, of what he has been able to do nationally. I'm like one of his members of his fan club now. And uh, he has just always been a very uh, grounded individual, but a very good reporter. So people go through Buffalo. People, people say to me, why can't we keep anyone here in town? Oh, yeah. Why do they always leave? Well, Buffalo has always been a city that you go through to get to a higher market. Right now, since the population has dropped, there are fewer journalists that want to stay here because, right. you know, you're not making as much money as you would right. if it was a, a larger market. So they want to go to Charlotte. They want to go to Chicago. So it's a great place to learn a lot about journalism, a lot of competition here to get that good story. Um, and that that's why people leave and go to other stations. Okay. Um, now, apparently, I'm looking here. Um, you stated that you almost got in, you almost died in a car accident. Mm -hmm. So and that's what got you it lit a fire up under you to get involved when you survived that it right. encouraged you inspired you to give back to your community here to reflect on right that. I never wanted to be a news story right. but I almost became a news story um it was on Christmas day about 15 years ago now and um I was headed home and uh was hit the bottom line it was hit on the expressway and I was thrown to the front of the car and broke, crushed my face and right. hips and a lot of internal injuries. I was in the hospital about three, three weeks, and it was near fatal. Uh, and I'm so thankful. So I decided um, quickly that if I had a chance to live, that I would give back. Mm -hmm. I made that, had that conversation with the Lord that I'll give more back if I can just make it through this right. and oh here I am today yeah, um, smile is back I at some point at one point I couldn't even smile and couldn't see and and now I see well and and I'm smiling because I have faith but also because uh I overcame it and right. I've been engaged that's why people see me all over the place because I made a deal mm -hmm. said I'll give back absolutely absolutely and and with that transition, you got yourself into the community and uh, you got yourself into urban. You went from communications to urban planning. Yes. And um, you remember the Apollo Theater? Yes. And let's talk. Let, let's talk about it. The Apollo, the Apollo <laughs> Theater. There's project. so much for us to talk about. How did that originally begin? The beginning of it? <laughs> well, when I was in Los Angeles... This is just really going back. Uh, when I was in L.A., I covered a number of stories. One was with a Robert Townsend. Mm -hmm. Robert Townsend was kind of a, a filmmaker who put his own money into his movies. Hollywood, Hollywood Shuffle. Hollywood Shuffle, yep. I love that film. Yep. Anyway, um, and there were other films. There were filmmakers, Singleton and others that were emerging, yes. Spike and others. And there was no um, Netflix back then, right? Right. So I said, you know, our people need place to see films. Now, this is after being engaged with the Oscar Michaud Theater, right? Mm -hmm. I had spent time with the Oscar Michaud Theater, and we had programs there for children. We ran Oscar Michaud films and like this. Then I went to California. So while I'm in California, I'm seeing, hearing all this buzz about Black filmmakers emerging and, and, and changing the narrative. And I was drawn to that. And uh, when I returned to Buffalo, I said, you know, there's something that we can do in our own community where we can uh, work with the local filmmakers, but also what is, is, is there a place where we can develop? And I thought about the Apollo Theater and the Apollo Theater, of course, I used to attend when I was a child, I used to see the cartoons there, 
and whatever else was going on there. And we would walk down Best Street, um, down Jefferson, and there we were in the heart of our community. It was just that easy. Now it's not that easy because it, there's just a lot of vacancies and disinvestment in, on Jefferson. But back then it was bustling. It was full of activities. I would go to the yep. movie. So I said, I want to return to that. And these children need a place where they can go, where it's safe, where they can see, like I did when I was a little girl, the world, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, cartoons, but they can see the world. Back then, we didn't have Netflix. We didn't have um, cell phones where we can just go out there and find the world so easily. So that's how I got involved in the Apollo Theater. I thought it would be a great launching pad for um, children for families to come together and to enjoy and become educated. Now, Sandra White has been sort of a spark plug and on a lightning rod to make us keep us on the track. And this this project, this idea, did not just start last week, last month. Um, in spite of what some of my critics might say that Dave Collins is doing this only because it's through the selection time. This project's been going on for over a year. So I, I just want to have uh, Sandy, Sandra White, if she would come forward just for a minute, because Sandra has a concept of what should be going on in here that, that's going to really be the nuts and bolts of what we, what we see happening. Go ahead, Thank Sandy. you very much, Councilman. I just want to say that we're all here because we know what we <coughs> But what we have to do is we have to release our own faith and believe that the Apollo community will return. And I think that's one thing that's lacking in our community is that we have a lot of negative thoughts about anyone doing anything. We have to rally around the correct spirit and we have to realize what we can do to make this community different. I just want to thank the councilman for providing the funds through community block grant money, for Ruth Lucci Tolliver for her support and the mayor and, and comptroller, as well as uh, the Corporation Council and many others in this community who stand behind us. This project will, well, this, this building, will open. I remember walking down the street with my little sisters. When we lived on Best between Grape and Peach. And we walked to the Apollo Theater and we watched cartoons. This theater will open. I want to speak this into existence and I want you all to join with me in believing that this community is going to be reborn. But it can only be reborn by the faith that you all like in your own hearts. So I ask you to support it beyond whatever you may feel today, but to believe in this community and to stand by Councilman and others who support this kind of project. And finally, Councilman, I just want you to know and others to know that there are investors interested, sincerely, investors that are interested in this block. They've been waiting for us, and I've been talking to them for the last year, I have talked to black filmmakers from New York, to Hollywood. They're interested. They need theaters like this, okay, to play their films. They need these kinds of venues, such because many of their films are not seen and distributed in the larger cinemas across the country. So Spike, Reginald Hudlin, uh, John Singleton, they're aware of this. I am firmly convinced that this will make it because and Magic Johnson Theaters. I've talked to the president and he is definitely online with us in terms of his support of this project. We talked eye to eye, all right? Now they are developing and doing something in the Baldwin Hills area in Los Angeles. They uh, are expanding throughout the country. I'm excited. This will happen. This is the future and we must believe in the young people what their needs are. So we ask you just to hold on to your faith and make this happen. And, and from there, um, so many other things materialized. It was a journey that led to a lot of activity and excitement about the Apollo. Like, can we do it? Is it possible? Who's going to do it? Right. And Beverly Gray, at some point, stepped up and had an idea as well. I wanted a movie theater and to, to develop the block. But she had a different idea on how it could be a telecommunication center. And I thought that made a lot of sense. And she had the the kind of the push behind her to get that going. Robert Cole's architect said to me, Sandy, you're a visionary type. 
because he was the architect of record working on the Apollo project. He says, you're a visionary. You need to go to school to learn more about development. And I just didn't know what to do at that point, but the path was there. And I was accepted in the School of Architecture and Planning, got to school, Beverly developed the Apollo Theater. And I was okay with that because it was not the big screen, but it was a screen and it allowed filmmakers and it allowed uh, television journalists uh, from the community, young people, an opportunity to go in there. And at least back then, that was the hope to 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 make magic, right? And I went on to school and from there led my new path where I am now an urban planner. I have my own company and I'm working behind the scenes on projects all over Western New York. It's Mustard Seed World Productions in case you want a documentary down or film. We're gonna be working on something I'm sure, Doug. I've been planning this for a long time. You're not aware of this but I've been wanting to work with you for a long time. So yeah. we're going to, in time, we'll work in on time. something. We will definitely do that. So talk to us about some of the projects that you, you've you been involved with. I know you're a certified MWBE and DBE firm. Uh, what are some right. of the, the many projects you've been involved in, in the Buffalo community? As a urban planner, I've worked behind the scenes on a number of projects with the architects, with engineering firms, with the city and state, on projects to create master plans. For example, the central terminal master plan. You cannot develop without a plan. So a master plan is very important. And that's exactly what we, our team worked on and provided for central terminal. We also work in the Michigan Street African-American Heritage Corridor. Some exciting things are going to be happening there. And we've been praying for that for a long time. Bishop Henderson, and of course, Mr. Yes. Arthur and George Scott. That has been, and Danny Williams. There's been a prayer and hard work over the years. I spent at least 15 years as a volunteer in the Michigan corridor before I even was a corridor with Bishop Henderson. And um, at that time, it was a dream, but we did what we had to do. There was a lot of details on what we were able to accomplish. Today, we have uh, some amazing individuals like uh, Terry Alfred and uh, Lily Upshaw working with a commission that's been established thanks to Crystal Peoples. Uh, so there, the community has come together. We've been all in different places, but coming together to create or recreate what will happen on Michigan Avenue in the future. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, the current, you're working on a, doc, one of the documentary projects you're working on involves uh, one of our, our queen mothers of education herself, Dr. 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 Eva M. Doyle. Eva M. Doyle, absolutely, absolutely. Queen, Queen Doyle, uh, I am so excited about this documentary. It's taken a while, but documentaries do take a little time. And yes, I have to yes, say Yes, they that do. I spent two years working on one back in the 90s. You did a good job on that one. <laughs> yeah, I remember People that. don't realize it. And I, you it know, was, I didn't. It's, what? It was a, uh, it took a while to build it. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not doing this alone. Greg Barber has been um, filming Dr. Doyle for years. And there was a moment when, maybe it was about five years ago, Dr. Doyle had a stroke and the word got around the community that she had been taken to the hospital. And we were just like shocked, prayed. And it came to my mind that I have not done enough in terms of telling the stories of our community. And so that's where it all started. I saw Greg Barber one day and I said, Greg, you have a lot of footage, don't you? He says, I do. I says, let's get together. Let's work on a documentary and let's tell her story, the Eva M. Doyle story. And the more I dig, 
And the more I get to know Mother Doyle, the more she opens her heart and tells me her dreams and aspirations and what she was able to accomplish without any support. I said, this, this person needs to be, her story needs to be shared with the community, but also the children. They need to know about Mother Doyle. You know, it's one thing to say that person was a great person. It's another thing to just give them roses while they're there, right. alive now. So we want to tell that story. We're in pre, we're actually now in production. We're finishing up in the next 30 days. Wink, wink. And <laughs> the goal is in fall of this year, 2023, okay. to have our first of many screenings. So, um, it's going to be exciting. We want to have the young people engaged in this process. So just like I started out as a young person in mm -hmm. in, uh, in television and video production, we're going to bring young people into this production themselves so that they can help tell the story. Yeah, so that's, that's the piece idea. that has evolved in this whole um, production. How do I get young people engaged? And how do we tell the story that we keep them engaged? So through the course of the last three or four years, so much has happened. But I think yes. we are already where we need to be. And we're and going to have that screening soon. And you recently did a project on uh, Leroy, Leroy Johnson's recent art exhibit at the Birchfield. That yes. involved the documentary as well. You know, they're, they're, everything overlaps sometimes when you're around long enough. Mm -hmm. And um, that was an exciting uh, documentary to work on with Leroy Johnson, because he's a friend, a family friend, um, a, a Kanisha's brother. Um, I didn't know that Leroy had suffered so much as a child. So in doing this documentary, I was able to get a clearer insight. You know, you know, as a journalist, the more you dig, the more you have an understanding of who you're talking to. And he opened up and shared with us that he was almost killed in a car accident and uh, actually a truck and he was um not able to stand uh for about three or four years and basically was on his back for a long time as a child but he was also exposed to role models as he grew up in buffalo and he attended with his sisters and brothers the african culture center the michigan y the, um, many of the arts and cultural groups in the community, like the bugle bands and, and the like, those groups, those institutions help shape him and help shape his brother, Rick James. And so we cannot lose um, sight of the value and importance of these institutions in our community. The more, the merrier, because each child needs some place to go. I want to back up a little bit. Uh, you said uh, you were, you were, and I've almost forgot about it too. You, you had it written here. You had a an IVB WIVB public affairs show, Insight. I remember that. I wish show. I had saved all those shows. I what, have some of them. What was what was it like to do that show? I have a few of those shows. It, it was fun doing those shows, but, I, but but you know what, doing the WIVB shows, and I give um, Sarah Lewis much credit, God bless her, she's now passed. When I returned to Buffalo, Sarah said, Sandy, why don't you do this public affairs show for WIVB? Because she worked for WIVB. And I said, okay, Sarah. And she says, it's just a half an hour, but it's community-based. And at that time, the show would air like at 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, Sarah, I don't think anybody would be watching. She says, you'd be surprised who's watching that early in the morning. People are getting ready for work and they're going places. And I later found out that people are watching. Not everyone's <laughs> watching. But there are a lot of people that get up early in the morning right. and they turn on. And as you had said before, Doug, that people, when they have a person of color on, they tend to kind of look again yeah. to make sure Absolutely. oh yeah that's that's sister sandy let me mm -hmm. see what she's talking about right so um yeah that's how i get involved in public affairs programming they don't do it enough anymore because maybe the right. fcc doesn't require uh those programs as much but um i do just want to share with you doug that um i do plan on going back and being on the air again 
And that is um, something I'm ready to do. Sure. Uh, whether I do it in commercial television or not uh, is something that's out there. But uh, I plan to get back out there. And I held back for many years uh, because that car accident did kind of shake me up a bit and I kind of shook my confidence. Mm. And uh, I just didn't want to do it anymore. But I have been working so hard to get back to myself and been working on community projects. And I'm so inspired by just what's happening in our community right now that I just want to get back out there. What are your views on the current state of the local media in Buffalo today? I mean, when I look at it, I mean, they seem like, uh, I, I came in at a time where they weren't really dealing with a whole bunch of, so I was lucky to get in myself. And now I'm looking around they seem to be hiring a lot of us, quite a few of us. Every now, every time, every time I turn around, I see somebody, a black person, getting hired at some of these stations. Isn't that refreshing? Yeah, it is very refreshing to see. Refreshing and, and, and interesting. interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think what is happening is that um, the pay is very low, uh, right. and they know they're getting young people out of college. So, and I heard the other day, if they're not. If you don't want the job, you don't want this pay, we have someone else who's going to fill it. Right. And I think that that's kind of like the the mindset that may be out there. I don't know, but mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, inquiring as to what's going on. But I also think that the pressure over the years has um, resulted in some more open-minded management individuals that are hiring people of color. Um, I'd like to see more in the anchor desks and six. Absolutely. In the 11, I'd like to see more in sports. I've been looking for a, a male in, in sports yeah. for the longest yes. uh, of color mm -hmm. uh, in Buffalo. And I don't know why we can't do this. I'm very, very pleased with seeing Channel 7 hiring an African-American woman in sports. Uh, we did have also an African American sportscaster at Channel Two. She's moved on. Mm -hmm. um, I just think we can do better. Yeah. Let's go, Buffalo. You were in the movie Selma. You had a you had a part in that movie, right? right. Selma, the movie Selma, I heard was in production, and I wanted to get into that film, not to be a star but to learn about filmmaking and to meet my idol, Ava DuVernay, director Ava DuVernay. I had done research on her and I called the casting director and said, I'm working in the African-American community in the historic corridor. And I just sent her all this information. She said, you fly yourself down here, you could be in the film. I flew myself down there. I got to meet Ruth Carter who was the Academy Award winning yes. twice mm -hmm. costume designer, worked with her, worked with everyone on that team, a very beautiful black and brown cinematographer, director, costume designers, everywhere I looked. And I'd never seen such a, a powerful team like that. And one day I got a chance to speak with Ava and she said to me, don't say you want to make films, say you are making them. And after that, I never stopped. And that's why I've been working on film after film, video and documentary, because she just gave me that little push to go forward and just make my dreams come true. As you look back over your career and everything that you've done, what do you think has been the, the significance of your contribution to the Buffalo community through, me, through media and through your community work. That's a good mixture. I right, should know. Right. <laughs> right. I'm just hopeful that I've been able to make a contribution that will impact or has impacted the lives of people and communities and families. Uh, that's been my original intent. Um, I have nothing more to say about it other than that 
the goal has never been for me to be seen on television. There are some people who go in this business and they just want to be seen. They actually don't want to be seen. During the live shots, I used to hide in a way. I never wanted to be up front. <laughs> I'm basically I'm a shy person. Um, I'm a slight introvert and also an extrovert. Yeah. Always Say, clashing. I'm the same. I'm the same. They're always clashing. I never want to really be seen. Right. But I've been told that you gotta be seen in order to get your job done and to communicate. I am a connector personality type, so. Uh, there is a drive within me to want to always connect with my community. And when I say community, I'm talking about the Black community, the Black and Brown community, but the community at large, in general, people in general. And I have a heart for my community, right? There's nothing wrong with that. And so my goal in life is to let my light shine. Let my light shine. That's what I've been taught all my life. And if it can shine in broadcast, if it can shine as an urban planner, Wherever I am, I just try to do that and to to give back because I did talk to the Lord about the second chance I had been given. And so I had to honor that and keep it moving, let my light shine. Sandy, it has certainly been a honor to have you on the Soul of Buffalo TV series on the Buffalo History Channel honor for me to be on it with you. Absolutely.